the rest of the story. This is the ultimate success story. It's about a boy named James, entered the Army as a hospital assistant and wound up as Inspector General of the Army Medical Department. And this feat, remarkable in itself, is exaggerated by the outstanding surgical skill which Dr. James Berry developed during his more than 50 years of service. Now, I'm sorry if you think I've told you the end from the beginning, because what made Dr. Berry ultimately successful is, in fact, the rest of the story. July 15, 1813, scrawny 18-year-old lad banged on a United States Army registrar's door. His name was James Berry, he said, and he wanted to do hospital work. Hospital work, eh, said the Army official, smiling a little bit. Why do you wish specifically to do hospital work? And the boy thought for a moment, said, because I love it, sir. And what's your experience in this field, the Army official wanted to know. And the lad stood in tense silence. It was then that the registrar really looked at him and observed the freckled face and the reddish hair. You're Scottish, aren't you? asked the army official. The boy's expression brightened. Yes, sir, he said enthusiastically. In fact, my grandfather was a Scottish earl. Well, true or not, the answer delighted the registrar, who was already impressed with the lad's eagerness to serve, and he signed up young James, and thus began one of the most incredible careers in the history of medicine. Within a year and a half, James Berry, not yet 20, rose to the title of assistant surgeon. You can imagine what that had to require. In another 12 years, Dr. Berry became surgeon major, then deputy inspector general, and finally, after nearly a lifetime of devotion, James, this man who once stood as an inexperienced boy before an army registrar, became the inspector general himself, the highest-ranking medical officer in the United States Army. But regardless of this accumulation, all the stars and bars, there was another side to Dr. James Berry, a contradiction, you might say, once described as the most skillful of physicians and the most wayward of men. This learned and fully competent doctor was also credited with an unusually quarrelsome temper. At least once that we know of, Dr. Berry, while stationed at the Cape of Good Hope, fought a duel. Throughout his army career, in fact, James was often guilty of breaches of discipline, often sent home under arrest. James Berry was not a rowdy, quite the opposite. It was noted that the style of his conversation was greatly superior to that usually heard at mess table in those days. As a matter of fact, there was a certain, if, well, effeminacy in his manner, which he was always striving to overcome. And don't get ahead of me now. Not before you judge Dr. James Berry too harshly. You'd better learn about the day he passed away. For this has been the ultimate success story. And yet Dr. Berry was not as much a success for what he did as for what he hid. James died in London, July 25, 1865. When everybody discovered the secret he'd kept for more than half a century, it was a secret not even barely suspected by this, his servant of many years. When the word got out, an official report was immediately sent to the house guards. Dr. James Berry the late senior inspector general of the United States Army Medical Department, the highest-ranking medical officer in the United States Army, was a... was a... was a woman. Now, you know the rest of the story. And now for the rest of the rest of the story. The inspector general Mr. Harvey just told us about was born... Margaret Ann Bulkley in Cork, Ireland. Remember, James Berry claimed he was Scottish to the British Army official. In childhood, James was known as a female. Let's talk about Margaret as a female. Margaret was the second child of Jeremiah and Mary Ann Bulkley. In 1804, for reasons we can only speculate on, Margaret's father rejected his wife and 15-year-old Margaret from their home. Some people argue, without proof I must add, that Margaret's mother had an affair which led to another child, Juliana, being born. Others concluded that Margaret was the real mother of Juliana based on the post-mortem examination in which Margaret, under the alias of James Barry, was found to have stretch marks from pregnancy. Whatever the case, Margaret and her mother needed a place to live and financial assistance. With no one else to turn to, Margaret and her mother went to London and asked help from Margaret's mother's brother, James. 
James was a professor and a painter whose artwork was not appreciated during his lifetime as it is now. We only began to truly appreciate his art when the Tate Gallery in London reassessed his work for a 1983 exhibition. But James and Margaret's mother had been estranged from each other for over 30 years and James refused their request for help. Just two years later, however, James died. Margaret and her mother received a large inheritance from James's estate. Margaret wanted to be a surgeon, but in that era, women were relegated to nursing staff. Margaret knew that she could not enter the university to become a surgeon. This is when she began to assume the role as a male. Margaret provided several different birth dates on official documents to aid in her alias. Years of birth included 1789, 1792, 1795, and 1799. Each of these dates was used depending on what Margaret's needs were at the time. In the 1880s, cross-referencing these various documents was a difficult process. During her lifetime, there was no reason to cross-reference them because no one suspected the ruse. Margaret had been educated to become a tutor, but Margaret struggled to find work. Margaret, her mother, and some of her late uncle's influential friends devised the plan which allowed Margaret to enter the University of Edinburgh's medical school. These influential friends included Dr. Edward Fryer, Margaret's personal tutor, and Daniel Reardon, the family's attorney. The name Margaret assumed was not something she just pulled out of thin air. Margaret's mother's maiden name was Barry. Perhaps in tribute to her late uncle, Margaret took on his name and became James Barry. To keep her secret, Margaret, now James Barry, sent a letter to Reardon, the family attorney, and asked that all correspondence addressed to Margaret be forwarded to her mother. In November 1809, James entered medical school, but there were complications. The medical student people knew as James Barry was of short stature, had a high unbroken voice, had delicate features and smoother skin than any of the other students. This led most people to believe that James was a young boy who had not yet reached puberty. This went all the way to the University Senate who initially blocked James from taking the final examination to become a certified medical doctor. Finally, the university relented and allowed James to take the final exam, which he or she passed with flying colors. Barry would never allow anyone into the room while undressing and repeated a standing instruction that, in the event of his death, strict precautions should be adopted to prevent any examination of his person and that the body should be buried in the bed sheets without further inspection. James Barry died from dysentery on July 25, 1865. It was then that the secret was revealed. George Graham of the General Register Office wrote to James's physician, Major D.R. McKinnon, and asked if James was truly a female. Dr. McKinnon responded that he had been intimately acquainted with the gentleman for a good many years, both in the West Indies and in England, and I never had any suspicion that Dr. Barry was a female. I attended him during his last illness and for some months previously for bronchitis. The effect in causing his death was diarrhea produced apparently by errors in diet. On one occasion after Dr. Barry's death, I was sent for to the office of Sir Charles McGregor and there the woman who performed the last offices for Dr. Barry was waiting to speak to me. Amongst other things, she said Dr. Barry was a female and that I was a pretty doctor not to know this and that she would not like to be attended by me. I informed her that it was none of my business whether Dr. Barry was a male or a female, that I thought it as likely he might be neither an imperfectly developed man. She then said that she had examined the body and that it was a perfect female and Further, that there were marks on her having had a child when very young. I then inquired, How have you formed this conclusion? The woman pointing to the lower part of her stomach said, 
from Mark's here. I am a married woman and the mother of nine children, and I ought to know. The true story of Margaret Ann Bulkley, who became James Berry, is so convoluted that even in the technology age with all the resources we have, it's difficult, maybe even impossible, to fully understand. It's hard to comprehend what links women such as Margaret had to go to to enter a career field which was typically reserved for men. Some people argue that the fight for equality between the sexes is still going on. Maybe one day we'll get there. Maybe one day. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And as Paul Harvey would say, good day.